Hello everyone, uh, I am Dr. Rohit, Associate Professor, Department of Critical Care, IMS in Sun Hospital. So today we are discussing about uh, magnesium disorders in critical ill. So this is a uh, usual uh, ECG in the ICU, uh, which shows uh, premature ventricular contractions. Uh, so these are ventricular bigemini. This is very common in the ICU. So as soon as we see such an ECG, our uh, knee-jerk reflex is to give this drug. And this is basically magnesium sulfate, which is uh, 5 grams in 10 ml injection. And we sort of usually give it uh, as 2 grams uh, over uh, 1 hour. So to understand further why this is a knee-jerk reaction till now, the reasons we tend to ignore magnesium is because uh, we've got limited understanding of magnesium physiology. We've got limited understanding of significance and frequency of derangements in magnesium balance. And uh, we have a general feeling that uh, giving magnesium is harmless. And uh, that is because we sort of know that hypomagnesemia is much more common than hypermagnesemia. And uh, uh, so basically giving magnesium uh, won't be uh, such a danger to the patient. So the outline of today's uh, discussion will be on three basic topics. That is, what is magnesium homeostasis and how, do, how, do, how does our body achieve this homeostasis? Uh, then we discuss about hypomagnesemia and uh, then I'll be talking about hypermagnesemia. So coming to magnesium homeostasis, uh, so if you see the overview of magnesium homeostasis, it is the fourth, fourth most abundant cation and second most abundant intercellular cation. The total content of magnesium in our body is uh, 2000 milliequivalents, which approximates to around 24 grams of magnesium. So from now on, I'll usually be talking about uh, uh, magnesium in terms of uh, milliequivalents so that uh, uh, there is uniformity in the discussion. Uh, in the total content of 2000 milliequivalents of magnesium in our body, uh, most of it is inside the tissues and uh, what sort of tissues? Uh, basically, bones have got 50% of the magnesium stored in them. Muscles have got 25%. Soft tissues have got uh, around 25%. And erythrocytes have got around 0.5%. Uh, and the serum magnesium is actually a very small percentage. That is around 0.3% of the total magnesium in our body. And even in the serum magnesium, which is around 0.3% of the total magnesium in our body, we've got 70% in ionized form and 30% bound to proteins. So just like calcium, the ionized fraction of magnesium is the one which is the active fraction. And this is the one that we are trying to uh, compensate by giving magnesium as an injection. So if you see the regulation of magnesium homeostasis, uh, the uh, GI absorption is the main uh, mechanism uh, by which the magnesium is absorbed. And uh, the second route by which uh, the major regulation happens is through the kidney, uh, which controls the amount of magnesium that is excreted. Uh, daily, the intestines uh, absorb approximately 120 milligrams of magnesium and uh, secrete approximately 20 milligrams of magnesium for a net absorption of around 100 milligrams from the intestines, uh, which goes into the blood. And uh, in the kidney, uh, there is 2,400 milligrams of magnesium, which is filtered by the glomerulus, of which 2,300 milligram is reabsorbed along the kidney tubules. And this results in a net excretion of 100 milligram again, which matches the intestinal absorption of 100 milligram. And bone and muscle are the most important magnesium stores, uh, as I've already shown in the previous slide. Bone constitutes approximately 50% of the stores, and the muscles constitute around 25 to 30% of the stores. So if you uh, delve a little deeper into how the magnesium absorption happens in the intestine, uh, the bulk magnesium is absorbed in a parasolular mechanism by the late part of the small intestine. Uh, the fine tuning of magnesium absorption takes place uh, transcellularly by the colon, where the TRMP6 and TRMP7 uh, receptors are present. And uh, these channels facilitate luminal magnesium absorption from the lumen to inside the cell. And uh, once the magnesium is taken up by the enterocyte, uh, the CNM4, CNNM4 uh, provides the basolateral magnesium extrusion mechanism into the blood. However, if you notice here, uh, unlike uh, uh, calcium, there is no role of vitamin D uh, 
uh, or pKH in magnesium absorption. Uh, so the second most important organ in magnesium regulation in the body is the kidney. And uh, if you see, this is a photo showing the uh, magnesium reabsorption in the kidney. Uh, the glomerulus filters the blood and along the nephron, 95% of the uh, magnesium which has been uh, filtered is reabsorbed. This reabsorption involves the proximal tubule, the thick ascending limb of leucophenle and the distal tubule. Uh, if you see the percentage of reabsorption that happens after the filtration of the glomerulus, thick ascending limb is the one where the maximum reabsorption happens. This is around 50 to 70 percent of the total reabsorption of magnesium. Uh, <clears throat> once the reabsorption has happened uh, from the lumen of the, um, of the uh, <clears throat> tubules to inside the cells, uh, there are extracellular calcium sensing receptors uh, which act through changes in voltage and permeability and thus regulate the amount of basolateral transport of the magnesium from inside the cell to the interstitial. However, this mechanism is not completely understood, uh, but uh, the facts remain that the thick ascending limb is the site of maximum absorption, reabsorption of magnesium after the filtration from the glomerulus. So uh, among the two disorders of magnesium, that is hypo and hypermagnesemia, hypomagnesemia is much more common than hypermagnesemia. So we'll be discussing hypomagnesemia first. So if you see the etiologies of uh, hypomagnesemia, uh, they can be divided according to the mechanism of uh, um, how uh, the uh, hypomagnesemia happens. Uh, they are basically again divided into uh, two, that is one is uh, gastrointestinal disorders and the other is uh, renal losses. If you see the gastrointestinal uh, disorders, uh, it includes prolonged NG suction, it includes malabsorption syndromes, it includes extensive bowel resections, it includes uh, acute and chronic diarrhea, intestinal fistulae, and even hemorrhagic or edematous pancreatitis. Uh, in the renal disorders, which can produce uh, uh, hypomagnesemia, you have osmotic diuresis caused by very high sugars or uh, administration of mannitol or very high urea levels. You also have hypercalcemia, which can cause renal losses of magnesium. You have drugs like diuretics. Loop diuretics are very notorious for uh, um, hypomagnesemia. You can have antimicrobial agents as well, like aminoglycosides uh, and amphotericin, which can cause hypomagnesemia. And of course, renal diseases uh, like chronic menstrual nephritis, and uh, when in the recovery phase of the ATN, where you have the diuresis, you can have hypomagnesemia and you can also have it in renal tubular acidosis. So just to focus a little bit more on uh, the gastrointestinal disorders, uh, the magnesium content of the upper intestinal tract is approximately one milliequivalent per liter. And uh, therefore, if you see uh, vomiting and nasogastric suction may contribute to magnesium depletion. And uh, uh, on the other hand, magnesium content of diarrheal fluids and fistulous uh, drainage is much higher. That is approximately 15 milliequivalents per liter. And consequently, in conditions where there is diarrhea and there is fistulae, there is much more amounts of magnesium depletion than in cases when there is prolonged NG suction and vomiting. And uh, uh, <clears throat> in hemorrhagic or edematous pancreatitis, around 20% cases of hemorrhagic and edematous pancreatitis can have uh, saponification of magnesium in the necrotic peripancreatic fat and thus produce hypocalcemia. Hypercalcemia uh, as a renal cause of hypomagnesemia is also known and uh, <clears throat> has been shown to decrease magnesium absorption in the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb and uh, probably the mechanism of renal magnesium wasting uh, or the tendency towards hypomagnesemia is is because it alters the gradients of uh, calcium and magnesium at the level of the thick ascending limb of the tubules. <clears throat> and uh, diuretics uh, are basically acting on the proximal tubule, such as carbon penetrated inhibitors and osmotic diuretics as well, can cause a uh, moderate increase in the magnesium excretion. And uh, the diuretics which act at the loop of Henle, such as the furosemide, uh, bimetonide, have been shown to uh, increase the magnesium wasting as well. And uh, the effect of thiazide diuretics is actually a little controversial. Uh, some studies show that uh, there is a magnesium wasting effect, but some studies show that uh, the magnesium levels are actually increased. 
um, and as I've already mentioned, the amongst the uh, amongst the antibiotics or antimicrobial agents, the aminoglycosides are are very notorious to cause an ATN, and thus in the in the recovering phase of the ATN, they can they can cause magnesium wasting. So just to focus a little bit more on what I just summarized. Uh, here are the list of drugs which can cause hypomagnesemia. So when when we've got patients on on these uh, drugs, they can uh, they have to be very careful that patients can produce hypomagnesemia. And uh, the loop diuretics uh, they basically increase the renal magnesium excretion, and uh, this is by affecting the transepithelial voltage and at the level of the tubules, and inhibit inhibiting the passive absorption of uh, magnesium at the level of the tubules. The amphotericin B and aminoglycosides again they cause renal magnesium wasting, secondary to causing an acute tubular necrosis. And uh, the cisplatin is again causing renal magnesium wasting, secondary to acute tubular necrosis. Along with it, cisplatin also causes hypomagnesemia by lowering an intestinal absorption of magnesium as well. So patients on chemotherapy with cisplatin are, are very uh, prone to having hypomagnesemia. So they, they, they should be supplemented with magnesium. So what are the clinical manifestations of hypomagnesemia in the critically ill patients? So if you see, they are divided into two. One is the biochemical uh, manifestations and one is the... So if you see what are the manifestations of uh, hypomagnesemia in the critically ill, you have uh, either biochemical manifestations or you have either clinical manifestations. So biochemical manifestations are equally common as clinical manifestations. So both need to be go hand in hand. And as a clinician, you should be able to detect it from both in your labs as well as clinically. So if you see the biochemical manifestations, they are uh, basically two. That is uh, either hypokalemia or hypocalcemia. So if you have a patient who's got hypomagnesemia, these are the two abnormalities which you might have on the labs along concomitant with the hypomagnesemia. So if you see about half of the patients with hypokalemia are uh, uh, also having magnesium depletion in the ICU. And uh, however, uh, patients with uh, magnesium depletion have a renal loss of potassium, which is caused by an, uh, by an increased potassium secretion in the collecting tubule and cortical uh, collecting tubule. And uh, in the kidneys, potassium is basically absorbed across the basolateral membrane via the sodium potassium ATPS pump and uh, secreted into the lumen of the collecting tubule and cortical collecting tubule. And uh, this process is mediated by the luminal potassium channels. The potassium channels which are which regulate this are called as the ROM-K channels. This is a very important uh, ROM-K channel, which, uh, which uh, happens to control both the potassium and the magnesium. And when there is uh, hypomagnesemia and there is a very uh, low amount of intracellular magnesium, these potassium ions uh, move freely through the ROMK channels and uh, at physiologic intracellular magnesium concentrations, ROMK conducts more potassium ions inward uh, than outward and uh, hypomagnesemia is associated with the reduced uh, intracellular magnesium, which in turn will release this inhibitory effect on potassium flux. And when there is a release of this inhibitory uh, effect on the potassium flux. There is a lot of potassium flux into the lumen and uh, consequently there is a hypokalemia. And uh, hypocalcemia is also a consequence of hypomagnesemia. So hypocalcemia can be explained by very low PTH levels uh, which are produced and uh, this is due to a the altered um, and, uh, and leading to an altered activation of the calcium uh, sensing receptors and, and subsequently hypocalcemia uh, along with the hypomagnesemia. So if you see the clinical manifestations of uh, hypomagnesemia, they can be divided into three. Uh, one is the cardiovascular manifestations, the other is the neuromuscular manifestations, and third is the investigational uh, investigational uh, therapies uh, which, which can be used uh, in hypomagnesemia. So if you see the cardiovascular manifestations, uh, notoriously they are known to cause dysrhythmias. As I already showed you in my second slide, uh, of this presentation, uh, I showed you a case where there was uh, there was multiple VPCs which were coming for a patient, and immediately uh, the registrar uh, tried to give some amount of magnesium. So dysrhythmias are the most common manifestations of hypomagnesemia, and they can range from ventricular tachycardia leading to tacitus respondus. They can also cause atrial fibrillation, and uh, they can also cause SVTs. So why do dysrhythmias actually come when there is uh, hypomagnesemia? So basically, when magnesium is an essential cofactor, 
of the sodium potassium ATPs pump, which controls the movement of sodium and potassium across the cell membranes. So low serum magnesium has been correlated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery. And that's why uh, there is always uh, uh, a tendency of the surgeons, the cardiac surgeons after surgery, to give a prophylactic magnesium infusion post-op to prevent the atrial fibrillation. And uh, whenever there is an arrhythmia, you have to consider that there might be a potential magnesium depletion in this patient. And even though there might be some serum magnesium levels which are normal, there might be intracellular depletion of magnesium. And it's not very, uh, and it's it's probably a wise option at that point to give a magnesium uh, a dose of around 1 to 2 grams and uh, prevent the further occurrence of this dysrhythmia. And what are the ECG changes that can come up with this uh, uh, with hypomagnesemia? They include uh, prolonged QT into QT intervals, prolonged PR intervals, uh, you can have wide QRS, you can have peak T waves and you can have ST depression as well. A little bit of investigational uh, 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 issues which have come with hypomagnesemia is that it's been studied in a few uh, patients that it can also cause uh, hypertension. It has contributed to hypertension in patients and uh, basically it has caused vasospasm and uh, leading to consequent hypertension. But none of this has been proved as of now as magnesium being the sole cause of this vasospasm and hypertension in patients. The neuromuscular manifestations of hypomagnesemia range from tetany to, to spontaneous carpopedal spasm and uh, to also seizures, and it can also cause muscular weakness, tremors, fasciculations. Uh, it can also cause uh, depression and psychosis. So these are the neuromuscular manifestations, and these manifestations are also related to the, to the uh, magnesium being a cofactor for the sodium potassium ATPs power. The investigational uh, um, investigational issues with magnesium, which are still there, are uh, basically uh, <clears throat> whether magnesium can precipitate acute hypomagnesemia, can precipitate hypo acute cerebral ischemia, whether it can it has it contributes to causing uh, acute myocardial infarctions, whether it is uh, with a, whether it can lead to asthma exacerbations, and of course in uh, preeclampsia. So magnesium therapy in general is no longer recommended for acute. Uh, myocardial infarction and to date basically there is insufficient evidence to support it, its routine use in acute cerebral ischemia, acute myocardial infarction and asthma uh, exacerbation. But the only place where you would probably give magnesium is a preeclamptic patient who is uh, uh, probably also having a certain amount of predisposition to go into, a, go into eclampsia and has high risk features. So to elaborate on this further, uh, there have been Two major trials uh, with respect to patients who's, uh, who've, uh, uh, in whom this magnesium has been used as an investigation, investigational therapy. And one of them is called as the ISIS-4 trial. That is the fourth international study of infarct survival trial and where they've uh, uh, taken around 58,050 patients. And uh, how they did not find any significant reductions in five, five weeks mortality in patients with suspected acute myocardial infarction in whom intravenous magnesium sulfate, sulfate was given. Similarly, there is the MAGIC trial, which is, uh, which, is which, was in, uh, which came up in 2002, where an early administration of intravenous magnesium to high-risk patients with acute myocardial infarction. Uh, this was an RCT which, uh, which involved uh, around uh, uh, 6,000 patients uh, with STEMI who were randomized to see either intravenous magnesium or placebo. But again, this was also a negative trial where uh, the study found no effect of early intravenous administration of magnesium on 30-day mortality. So at this point, probably, uh, although uh, I would like to say that Probably, uh, if even if uh, magnesium has caused a lot of uh, dysrhythmias in a patient who has come to you, prophylactic administration of magnesium to prevent an acute myocardial infarction is, is not the norm. It has no evidence for it and uh, it should not be practiced. So the diagnostic evaluation of hypomagnesemia, uh, normal serum magnesium levels are approximately 1.5 to 1.9 milliequivalents per liter. And assessment of magnesium is in the routine day-to-day -day practice is usually through the serum total magnesium levels. However, the serum magnesium level has got total magnesium level has got its own pitfalls. It's got multiple confounders. Although the serum magnesium is easily available, but it does not reflect the total body magnesium stores uh, because of the physiologic distribution of magnesium that I've already mentioned. 
the total serum concentration of magnesium is 0.3% of the total amount of magnesium present in the body. So it's obviously a bad reflector of the amount of magnesium that is present, total amount of magnesium that is uh, present in the body. And uh, the second most, uh, uh, second best test to assess the diagnostic evaluation of uh, hypomagnesemia is magnesium tolerance test. It is, uh, it is the most accurate uh, and, uh, uh, and best test, but uh, only in used in special circumstances. And this test is basically used when there is, when if there is a suspicion, clinical suspicion of magnesium deficiency, which is very strong, but the serum magnesium levels are normal. This is not performed on day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the test is performed by measuring the magnesium in a 24-hour urine collection and uh, which distributes, uh, uh, which where you, where you give a parenteral magnesium injection uh, of uh, around 2.4 milligram per kg body weight. And it is given over the initial, uh, initial first four hours. Uh, the, before starting the infusion, you take one uh, urine collection and after giving the infusion, uh, you give, take a urine collection uh, 24 hours later and you see whether there is an adequate amount of magnesium load that has got uh, excreted. If there is lesser amount of magnesium that has got excreted, which is, uh, which is expected, uh, lesser amount of magnesium which has got excreted, below the value which is expected for that patient, you know that there is magnesium deficiency in the body. And obviously this amount of uh, magnesium that has not got excreted has been used up by the body to replenish the stores of magnesium in the body. The third, which is third test for diagnostic evaluation is the ionized magnesium levels. Uh, obviously, uh, magnesium, uh, the, the fraction, which is the active form of magnesium is the ionized magnesium that is Mg2 plus. However, uh, this magnesium cannot be corrected, cannot be uh, known by using the albumin correction like calcium. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this cannot be done in the way that it is done for uh, calcium. So this is not a feasible means of knowing, uh, of assessing the exact amount of magnesium, which is, which is their amount in the body. So amongst the three tests, the most practical and feasible is uh, serum total magnesium, which we're using at the bedside on day-to-day -day basis. So coming to the treatment of hypomagnesemia, uh, the first question is, does it matter if I don't treat uh, hypomagnesemia? And uh, mm, the answer to this is actually coming from one of the uh, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And uh, it, this was done in 2017, where they've seen whether if does hypomagnesemia impact have any impact on the outcome of patients admitted to the intensive care unit. And collectively, what they showed was uh, that hypomagnesemia uh, was associated with a greater risk of mortality, sepsis, mechanical ventilation, and the length of stay uh, in patients with ICU. Obviously, there was only an association. And uh, at the end, they did conclude that the role of magnesium therapy for improving outcomes in critically ill patients is needed to be further studied. So in a, in a nutshell, probably I would say that hypomagnesemia is important. It does contribute to uh, several other uh, things going out of hand. So when you do have hypomagnesemia documented in your patient, you have to replete magnesium. So when giving magnesium therapy, a usual uh, rule of thumb is if you give one gram of uh, IV magnesium, that is equivalent to eight milliequivalents of IV magnesium, it should increase your serum magnesium by 0.15 milliequivalents per liter within a 24 hour period. So an approx dose for a patient in critically ill patient is uh, uh, around one to two grams of magnesium, IV magnesium. Uh, given within a 24 hour period that uh, would increase your serum magnesium levels adequately. Uh, the infusion time is very crucial when you're giving magnesium therapy uh, because uh, the magnesium has got a very slow distribution in the tissues, which I've already mentioned in my previous slides. Uh, but at the same time, it has got a very rapid renal excretion. So if you give the infusion slowly, so the tissues can take up the magnesium and there'll be less loss of magnesium. Uh, by renal excretion. And uh, the fastest speed that can be administered is a, is a point of debate even now. So yeah, there have been several protocols uh, with acute myocardial infarction. There have been several protocols with preeclampsia. But uh, on the whole, uh, 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 gist of the speed that can be administered is, is if you're giving a dose of magnesium, which is around four to six 
grams for a patient, you can give it over six to eight hours. Anything above six grams, you will have to space it out over a 24 hour period because that would cross the, reach the limits of the amount of magnesium that the body can take in a 24 hour period. And uh, most important point when you're giving magnesium therapy is to be careful in, in patients with renal failure uh, because that's the only route that magnesium is excreted from the body. So you have to uh, be careful that you not cause iatrogenic hypermagnesemia by giving magnesium therapy in renal failure patients. So to elaborate on this a little further um, uh, as to what um, is the role of treating magnesium or giving magnesium in hypomagnesemia. This is the Magpie study from Lancet, which came in the year uh, 2002. And uh, this Magpie trial was basically for patients with preeclampsia where uh, and their babies did the benefit from magnesium sulfate infusion. And this uh, was actually a, a, a positive trial where they saw that magnesium sulfate for prevention of preeclampsia was very, very useful and uh, they did reduce the risk of, of uh, maternal death. And since then, uh, patients who are in preeclampsia and having high-risk features have been given magnesium therapy to prevent the progress into eclampsia. And this was seen that, all, that even though the magnesium was given as an infusion, uh, they did not have any amount of harmful effects to the mother or the baby in the short-term period post-delivery. So coming to hypermagnesemia, which is the uh, lesser, uh, which is much more, uh, much lesser um, uh, in incidence than hypomagnesemia. The etiologies of uh, hypermagnesemia are very, very rare. And this is because uh, the loop reabsorption of magnesium is always appropriately diminished when you load a patient with magnesium. So even though you have patient who's got a very high dose of magnesium in a very short period, the, the loop of LA actually tries to prevent the reabsorption and, and let it get excreted. And you have very, and that's why you have hypermagnesemia, which is very rare. So obviously the loop of LA and the kidneys are a very important part of all the uh, all the mechanisms that try to prevent hyper may have hydrogenic hypermagnesemia. And that's why the first etiology of hypermagnesemia is, uh, is uh, kidney impairment. And the mechanism is basically by reduced during the excretion of uh, magnesium. And uh, magnesium infusion in preeclampsia and eclampsia uh, is actually at a very high dose. And, and when such high doses are given, even patients with a, with a very minimal or no renal failure can also have hypermagnesemia. And uh, oral ingestion of antacids and, and oral ingestion as a part of antacids and laxatives is also known to cause hypermagnesemia. And this is because they contain a lot of magnesium salts. So they are a sort of strict contraindication in patients with renal failure. The clinical manifestations of hypermagnesemia are dependent on the amount of uh, magnesium levels that are achieved in the serum and the plasma. So if you have uh, magnesium levels of around 4 to 6 millipolets per liter, uh, patients can become drowsy and they start developing diminished deep tendon reflexes. And uh, that's, uh, that's the genesis of uh, monitoring deep tendon reflexes in patients who are on, uh, with preeclampsia, who are on magnesium infusions. When you have 6 to 10 milliequivalents per liter in the, in the plasma, you patients can develop absent tendon reflexes and uh, you can have bradycardia and start developing a lot of ECG changes. And above 10 milliequivalents per liter, the patient starts becoming extremely sick with respiratory failure and possible uh, cardiac arrest as well. So the diagnostic evaluation of hypermagnesemia is similar to hypomagnesemia. And the most common way to measure the magnesium levels is the serum total magnesium. Although it does have its own pitfalls that the amount of magnesium uh, in the serum is not really reflective of the magnesium stores. It, it, it is the only way by, by which we know whether there is hypermagnesemia or not. So the treatment of hypermagnesemia is uh, uh, basically by... Uh, by knowing whether the patient has a normal or an impaired kidney function. Um, the best approach is basically by prevent by anticipation and prevention of uh, hypermagnesemia. If your patient has normal or near normal kidney function, uh, you'd like to cessate the magnesium therapy 
and you can add a loop or a thiazide diuretic which can cause hypomagnesemia in this patient with hypermagnesemia. If you have patients with moderate kidney impairment, you can again, uh, you have to cessate the magnesium therapy and you can hydrate the patient with isotonic fluids uh, and you can also add a loop diuretic. Uh, with severe kidney impairment, of course, uh, that, that becomes an emergency where you have no means of, of uh, excretion in this patient and you have to do a session of dialysis to remove the amount of magnesium and reduce the hypermagnesemia. Intravenous calcium has also been used as a magnesium antagonist to reverse the neuromuscular and cardiac effects of hypermagnesemia in emergency situations. And the usual dose is 100 to 200 milligram of elemental calcium uh, over 5 to 10 minutes. And uh, this is usually a salvage measure until you try to incorporate the uh, the definitive therapy of giving uh, a diuretic or, or for dialysis. So what is the role of focus in hypermagnesium? This is an interesting article by uh, Sai Saramital, uh, where uh, they've uh, mentioned about, uh, about a case where they use the focus for predicting the risk of magnesium toxicity in critically ill, uh, Ill, Ill preclamptive patients. Uh, magnesium is definitely a drug which has got a very narrow therapeutic index and uh, it's predominantly excreted by the kidneys. And uh, the kidneys are the organs that are, are uh, commonly compromised in preeclamptic patients. And uh, so basically when we give magnesium for preeclamptic patients, there is a possibility that that they can have hyper hypermagnesemia and toxicity and uh, monitoring of magnesium with uh, clinical monitoring of magnesium by, by seeing the deep tendon reflexes, the respiratory rate and urine output sometimes doesn't match up to the amount of uh, um, amount of uh, symptoms that the patient has uh, and obviously the lack of uh, serum magnesium monitoring uh, every hourly in a patient with uh, preeclampsia is not possible so what they have uh, suggested in this case report is is uh, to see uh, for a focus scan where uh, if you have preeclamptic patients where uh, there is a possibility of congenital anomalies as well in patients with preeclampsia, kidney and now congenital kidney anomalies in patients with preeclampsia. You can detect it on focus and uh, try to give reduced dosages of magnesium and try to control the amount of hypermagnesemia uh, that happens in such patients. So what are the take-home points of uh, uh, this discussion on magnesium disorders? Magnesium deficiency is extremely common and uh, it is uh, hypomagnesemia is much more common than hypermagnesemia. Hypomagnesemia approximately 20% versus hypermagnesemia approximately 2-3% to of critical patients. And uh, there is associated hypokalemia and hypocalcemia when there is hypomagnesemia. Uh, this one has to be aware of and replete the potassium as well as the calcium uh, along with the uh, magnesium when you are uh, treating the hypomagnesemia. Uh, it is difficult to add, uh, assess the amount of hypomagnesemia in a patient because uh, of, the, uh, of the obvious uh, reasons that the amount, the serum magnesium is not a good indicator of the total amount of magnesium that is there. But if in doubt, it is better to administer because the kidneys are uh, a very good means of excreting the amount of magnesium that you have. And thus, hypermagnesemia is very rare. And to be on the safer side, you can give, uh, uh, you can, it's better to administer the magnesium. Therapeutic strategies in critical ill have varied a lot. Uh, some regimens have given intermittent, some regimens have given continuous. But in the end, the amount of magnesium that you give, that is what is matters. It doesn't matter whether you give it in a continuous way or whether you give it in an intermittent way. And you have to maintain a very strong clinical suspicion to see that there is no hypermagnesemia in patients with renal failure.